We do not choose to exist. We do not choose what environment we grow up in. The people we become, the lives that we lead, the beliefs and values that we learn to hold, owe much to the lottery of our birth. Our starting point in life is one of complete dependence on forces, genetic and environmental, that we don't control. And these forces can shape us into many things. In fact, human history would suggest there's neither a belief too bizarre nor an action too appalling for humans to embrace, given the necessary cultural influences. This simple idea has profound implications for our personal and political freedom. Imagine two enemies on a battlefield. Let's say an Israeli and a Palestinian. Suppose we could go back in time and swap them at birth, so that each would be raised in the other's culture. In time, would each not end up fighting for the other side? A different flag, a different religion, a different ideology. This outcome would certainly surprise no one. It seems like common sense, but the implications are significant. We're readily admitting that the deepest convictions of these two individuals are, in a sense, arbitrary. Go back to the moment of your own birth. What kind of person could you be today with a different starting point in life? Clearly, you don't choose when, where, or to whom you're born. You don't choose to be born a Muslim or a Christian, rich or poor, into a war zone or a peaceful suburb. So think of all the human cultures that have ever existed that you could have been born into. A Maasai tribe, medieval England, fascist Germany. And with each one, what could you have ended up believing, fighting for, defending? Today we're appalled by the injustices of past societies, such as racism, sexism, slavery. But had any one of us grown up in one of those societies, there's no reason to think that we wouldn't have embraced their values and defended their traditions. The truth is, any any one of us might have developed loyalty to any group, nation, religion, ideology. Learned any language, practiced any social custom, or partaken in any act of barbarism or altruism. All of these ideas point to a simple truth: we do not choose our identity; we inherit it. Let's take a closer look at the reasoning here. As newborns, we're not responsible for our own natures. We're endowed with genes that we didn't ask for, and we're faced with a world that we played no part in creating. So, at what point do we become responsible for who we are? The answer is that we don't. By the time we're old enough to contemplate our own identity, we already have one. And by then, the way that we see the world is framed by our prior conditioning, and that conditioning informs every choice that we make. Even the choice to rebel against that conditioning. In short, long before we can shape the world, the world has firmly shaped us. Now, people tend to get concerned at this point. One worry is that these ideas imply that we can't hold bad people morally responsible for what they do. So, let's take an, an obvious example of a bad person, a serial killer. Is he responsible? Morally, for his own actions, for his terrible crimes. The uncomfortable truth is that it only makes sense to view him as morally responsible if we believe he chose his own identity, meaning his own genes and his own environment. But of course, it's logically impossible to choose an identity prior to having one. And if he didn't choose his identity, he can't be truly responsible for the actions that follow from it. 
Consider this true story. A middle-aged married man develops an overwhelming addiction to child pornography. Ultimately, this leads to a criminal conviction. But the night before his sentencing, he's rushed to hospital, complaining of severe headaches. A scan reveals a large brain tumor. The surgeons operate, they remove the tumor, and the man's behavior returns to normal. Six months later, his pedophilic tendencies return. He goes back to his surgeon, and sure enough, a portion of the tumor has grown back. They operate again, and again his behavior returns to normal. Now, at the point when the brain tumor is first mentioned, people's attitudes towards the man change dramatically. Instead of blaming him for his actions, they now blame the tumor, which of course he didn't choose to have. But what if he hadn't had the tumor? What if his actions had simply been the result of his genes and environment? Would that make him more blameworthy? Again, the answer is no. A person no more chooses their genes and environment than they do a brain tumor. Here's a key idea. Yes, we all make choices. You all chose what to wear today. But the choices that we make are made with a brain that we didn't choose. A brain whose workings we don't even understand. Just as a computer doesn't program itself, we don't wire our own brains. Our brains are wired by the interaction between our genes and our environment. Now, this way of thinking is counterintuitive. There's a strong urge to hold each other morally accountable for our actions, to blame and punish each other for our wrongdoings. But the surprising truth is, a prisoner is no more deserving of his sentence than the judge who passes it. As the proverb says, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Now, I should be clear at this point, this doesn't mean that we should never lock up or punish certain people. Sometimes there are very good pragmatic reasons for doing so. But to place the cordon of responsibility tightly around the individual blinds us to the forces that created that individual. Think of a sickly plant lacking sufficient nutrients, light, and water. To blame that plant for its own deficiencies would blind us to the impoverished environment in which it struggles to flourish. And it's the same with people. If we judge a person or group to be ultimately responsible for an action, it blinds us to the deeper causes of that action. The confluence of economic, political, and cultural forces that allowed it to occur. Now, once we understand that we are not the authors of our own identity, it's natural to ask, well, who is? For though our entry into this world is arbitrary, the world that greets us is not. Numerous forces vie for our attention and loyalty. Our minds are a battleground of competing forces. And the outcome of this battle determines who we become and the society that we create. Sadly, the forces that win out are rarely the most desirable. Throughout history, people have been conditioned to believe in oppressive ideologies, to support destructive systems, and to believe downright lies. If we're to get beyond our conditioning, we need to question the forces that have shaped us. We need to ask, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I have the habits that I have? And crucially, whose interests do they serve? It once served the interests of monarchs to spread among their subjects the idea of the divine right of kings. It once served the interests of imperialists to spread the idea of racial superiority. Today, it serves certain interests to spend $2 billion a year marketing fast food to children at a time when child obesity is a major public health problem. 
And each year, I think over $500 billion is spent on advertising globally. And of course, it's not for our benefit. Research has shown that materialistic values that saturate advertising have a toxic effect on human happiness. They're correlated with higher rates of mental illness, depression, and loneliness. A striking exa example of this took place in Fiji in 1990. At that time, bulimia didn't exist in Fiji. But in 1995, television was introduced, mainly from the US, and laden with advertising. Within three years, over 12% of teenage girls had developed bulimia. Now, it's when we question our identities, we need to question the information that we receive. But we also need to ask, what's been left out? In classrooms around the US, children, uh, children are taught to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, which links justice and liberty with the American flag. What they are not taught is that between 1945 and 2005, the United States attempted to overthrow 50 governments around the world, many of them democracies. And in the UK, how many of us learned that over the same period, Britain is complicit in the deaths of over 10 million people around the world? These examples, and many others, suggest that identities are often shaped to serve the interests of those with the power to do the shaping. Patriotism, consumerism, materialism, obedience, religious loyalty, they're not inevitable, they're learned. We are the soil in which our culture plants the seeds of belief, loyalty and behavior. This is the reason that over 90% of people born in Sudan become Muslim. Over 90% born in Thailand become Buddhist. And over 90% born in Italy become Catholic. If we're lucky, our culture will plant in us the seeds of reason and doubt so that we can grow the tools necessary to question our inherited identity and the world that we're confronted with. This is the closest we can get to escaping the arbitrary nature of our identity. Because if we're going to be shaped by something, it may as well be reality. And to stay in touch with reality, we need the tools to make our own discoveries and to question. <coughs> to question the agendas behind our education, media, culture, religious institutions, and the economic and political ide ideologies that underpin our lives. And it's of vital importance that this questioning takes place. To shape identities is to shape the future. But what future are we creating? Our world is scarred by war, extreme inequality, and environmental devastation. If we are to create an alternative future, we can't reproduce the thinking that shaped our past. The thinking that drives our one-dollar, one-vote democracies. The thinking that places short-term profits before human welfare and the environment on which we all depend. All these ideas expose the arbitrary nature of our labels and loyalties, of the labels and loyalties that divide us from each other and from reality. They provide a potent antidote to the kinds of dogmatic worldviews that compel us to kill and die for flags, symbols, gods and governments whose connection to us is no more than accidental. Now, I've only had time to touch on a few areas of this topic. There's much more to be said. But already it's clear that this view of freedom and responsibility requires a revolution in our thinking. It's supported by decades of research in psychology and neuroscience. To my knowledge, there's not a single scientific finding that provides support for any other conclusion. But the dominant view in our world remains that each person is ultimately responsible for the choices they make. The most advanced legal systems on the planet are founded on this assumption. 
And it lies at the heart of the American dream, which tells us anyone can become rich, and those that do deserve it, and those that don't only have themselves to blame. As it happens, this incoherent way of thinking makes it far easier to justify inequalities of wealth, power, and opportunity. But though powerful interests may profit from this view, it has absolutely no basis in fact. Instead, understanding that we are not ultimately responsible affirms the appropriateness of compassion as a response to all suffering. It shows that no person is more deserving of happiness or suffering than anyone else, whoever they may be and whatever they may have done. Now, all of these ideas are taken for granted when we talk about anything else in the natural world. But when it comes to us, we assume it doesn't apply. Perhaps it offends our egos. It is a humbling conclusion. But it's also empowering. To acknowledge that we are not ultimately responsible is the closest we get to taking responsibility. The more we understand the effect the world has had on us, the more we can control the effect we have on the world. The more we understand the limitations on our freedom, the better placed we are to transcend those limitations. It's, it's through understanding and questioning, not ignorance, that we empower ourselves to create a fairer, happier, more compassionate world. Thank you. <laughs>